open the show and then we'll come to the dialogue. Ten seconds, Ten seconds everybody. Ten seconds to the open. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Voice, Your Future. I'm your host and moderator, Armstrong Williams. Uh, before we in introduce the head of our city, the Honorable Muriel Bowser, our bureau in Jerusalem put together this package about the world and chaos. Take a listen. Our world is once again facing dark and challenging times. From a global pandemic to war, how did we get here? And how can we overcome these days of chaos and uncertainty? This is David Blumenfeld for The Armstrong Williams Show. We're clearly in a tumultuous time right now. I see this in, with clients that I'm working with. People are really scared. Rabbi Dr. Avidan Malevsky is a professor at Ariel University who spent his career studying trauma and its impact on how we grow up and see the world. Development is impacted by historical time and place. What happens in adulthood is driven by dynamics early in life. So using that framework, I figured let's look into Putin's early childhood environment to try to give us some idea about some of his behaviors as an adult. And sure enough, turns out that his family was impacted gravely by World War II. He was an only child because two of his older brothers died during and after the war. His family was in the siege of Leningrad for over 800 days. That family trauma is going to play out in a young child's life. So if you grew up in a home and there's a lot of trauma soon after World War II with a lack of security early on in life, they're going to develop within them a mistrust in society. So no wonder now that this person is an adult, he lacks trust in people around him and lacks trust in other governments and the West and trying to sit down and work things out peacefully. On one hand, what I experience as a child in terms of trust is going to impact my view of trust overall and my view towards God as well. But it's bi-directional. I could infuse God and spirituality into my life and start repairing the hurt that I have as it relates to trust. That's gonna help, again, not only with my relationship with God, but my core sense of trust is gonna be impacted and altered as well. People are really scared. People are legitimately scared about what's happening. And sometimes when we're dealing with such large terror, we need to sit down and schedule it the activities that provide meaning in our life. Family, friends, spiritual connections is such a crucial protective factor. It helps us survive this period of time and long term, it's gonna help us deal with turmoil in the future. This is David Blumenfeld for the Armstrong Williams Show. Mayor Bowser, as a Mayor Bowser, as a leader of the most important city in the world, the nation's capital, I think our correspondent, David Blumfeld, hit on something. Mm. People are on the edge. They're fearful. They're not as polite as they once were. The least little thing can set off sparks. How do you, as a leader of this capital city, calm the fears of your constituency? Well, I think you put your finger right on it. I think people are on edge. I think that we have had two years where our lives have really been upended. Our public safety ecosystems, our schools, our social dynamics, all upended. And I think that we don't truly know um, how we've changed. I don't think we know how we've changed as individuals, just how our brains function, how we receive information, how we embrace, how we talk, how we forgive. 
All of those things have been impacted by two years of isolation and social disruption. I know as the most acute way that it shows up in the work that I do uh, is people and their interpersonal conflicts that should end in an argument and two people walking away uh, can end up with one person dead. Uh, and we, we've seen that, unfortunately, not just in responding uh, to the last two years. I've actually seen that growing uh, in our communities uh, in, in increasing levels of conflict and gun violence. You know, in, in saying that, uh, while it is real, you must still give people something to believe in. People are still homeless and they need housing. People need to pay their rent. People need to have opportunities in cities so the economy continues to move. You have these legacy initiatives that no matter how dark and chaotic it may be, you must still provide leadership that make people feel that there is normalcy. The con economy continues, life continues. How do you do that? Well, we have to tell them every day the work that we do, because the truth is uh, we had two tr tough years, but we went into this pandemic strong with a roaring economy. People want to live here. People want to work here. Kid people want to send their kids to our schools, and we'll get back to that. Uh, and we come, we're coming out of this economy when people need to get back to their offices and back to work. But the truth is, in D.C., a lot of people stay connected to their jobs, stay connected to good-paying jobs. They never miss the paycheck. Uh, in some sections of our economy, in some sections of our our city were completely wiped out, like the hospitality sector. So our job was to make sure that we provided uh, relief, and I'm proud of the work that we did. Uh, we, we got out the door over $352 million in rental assistance, averting uh, eviction of 50,000 people uh, in the district. We got out over $2 billion in unemployment assistance, making sure people could pay their rent and feed their kids and do all the things they needed to do. Our restaurants who were creative and brave and kept their people employed, we gave them assistance, the hotel's assistance. So everything that a government could do, including giving po propane to restaurants on an empty RFK field. I mean, we have done a lot of things to pivot to make sure people could survive through this pandemic and get on the other side. But it is true. Um, we have to move from that relief stage and recovery stage to getting back to growth um, because ultimately that's what uh, my job is. And so part of the way that I communicate that uh, to all of DC residents uh, is through a big budget that we have before my council uh, that continues to focus on our human services needs, continues to focus on our public safety needs, but also focuses on how we bring our city back. Getting people back to work, business travel, tourism, nightlife, and entertainment, which are not fun and games for us because that hospitality and tourism is a big way that we fund all of our human services in the district. You know, something that you're very big on, um, you know, I always say that God makes us equal, but choices make us unequal. But you're a big proponent of equity across the board. How do you sure. achieve that? Well, I'm a, I'm a big pro proponent like you of opportunity. Uh, and I see it as our job in the government to give everybody a fair shot. And that doesn't mean the same thing for everybody. It doesn't mean the same thing for every neighborhood. So we have to look at all of the resources that we take in and invest in individual communities, individuals, so that they have an equal shot at living in a prosperous city. Look, I was born and raised in this town, in a very different Washington, D.C. Uh, and so I take it as a tremendous responsibility uh, to make sure that people like me and my daughter will be able to 
to buy homes and raise their families in D.C. So when I go around the town, nobody's telling me, hey, Mayor Bowser, you know, we want to go back to the way it was in the 70s in D.C. Or we want to go back to the way it was in the 90s. In some ways they do because they appreciated a rich cultural experience um, that they are concerned about fading. But they don't want to go back to days where our schools weren't performing or our neighborhoods weren't safe or that we didn't have the best amenities in the region. Nobody wants that. But everybody wants to make sure that the the opportunities that they had, like I had to grow up here with a great family, with a work ethic and an ability to have access to schools that work for us, Everybody wants that for their family. So uh, we are investing uh, in, a, in a package of initiatives that's really aimed at how do we keep black businesses in D.C.? How do we encourage black home ownership in D.C.? How do we help black seniors preserve their wealth and pass it on? Uh, and how do we continue to create more affordable housing in our city? You know, the forum tonight and following you have some very distinguished guests joining us is about faith and leadership what do you feel um, has been the best preparation for Muriel Bowser to be the person you are today as the chief executive of this city well you know I, I grew up with my with my parents telling me I could do whatever and that they were going to have my back And when I look out at the city, uh, I wish that for every child because it gives you the ability to dream big and to take risk. Because I know that no matter what, my mother and father would have my back. I would go back to a a story. We went to Catholic schools. I tell this story frequently uh, that my sister was the oldest and 16 years older than me. And they, she was in a, a public school. And my mother just, she said she was in third grade and she couldn't read. And so they made the decision, and it was five of us, to put us all in Catholic schools. And we're Catholic. And, you know, my parents went to Catholic schools too. And uh, it was just a, a huge, like, investment and sacrifice that they were making in us. But one day... Uh, I had gotten in trouble at school, and my mother had to come up to the school. And my teacher's name was Miss Thomas. I remember it like it was yesterday. And Miss Thomas is telling my mother, and I'm standing there. What? And then my mother said, "Did it ever occur to you that she's bored in your class?" And and Miss Thomas is like, "No, she." My, and so my mother's telling her she needs to be challenged. She needs to do this. But when I get outside and it's just me and my mother, she says, Muriel, I put five kids through this school and you're not going to embarrass me like this. But what it said to me was, when it's me and my mother against the world, it's me and my mother. But she's going to make sure that when I show up in the world, that I'm going to represent her in the way that she taught me. So I just, I have grown up in my life thinking that I could dream big and take risks and do big things. Uh, And I've always really, when I had the opportunity, I bet on myself. And I I believe, and in my political life for sure, I believe that sometimes windows open. They open just a little bit and they close fast. But when it opens, you better have yourself ready to jump through the window. And that's, that's how I live. You know, finally... In the two minutes we have left with you, COVID was certainly a challenge for you. It was a challenge for all of us. Yes, yes. but we're talking to our mayor. Yep. Yes. Um, And you had to make some very tough decisions, Mm -hmm. some which you were criticized for, and many that you were celebrated for. What did you learn about yourself and about the city, and what advice do you have as there seems to be a surge in COVID again? Sure. Well, uh, it's a hundred year pandemic. No mayor, no leader, no family, no individual, I think, was ever prepared for what that meant. What that meant is we had to close our city down, send people home from work, send kids home from school. And literally some people had no means to take care of themselves. That's what we had to do. And at the same time, we had to procure tests when they weren't available, gloves, mask, vaccine, wait for that. 
uh, and take in changing information seemingly on a daily basis and turn that into information that was usable for our residents. What I learned um, is that uh, in a crisis, I want to have the ball. I want to be the one sitting in the seat to make the decisions. Um, and I also learned, you know, I've been at this about 15 years, how to con work with everybody, our, our council, our press, to get the information out that we needed to get out. Um, but more than that, communicating clearly, factually, answering a lot of questions. I think uh, when I look back over this re COVID response, we probably did a daily press conference for three months straight. We did like 200 situational updates. I probably answered 10,000 questions from the media. Um, and then when I would go out in the community, pe people would tell me, I, I saw you, Mayor, I saw Dr. Nesbitt, Thank you for giving us this information. And, and very, I'll go out this afternoon and somebody will say thank you for keeping us safe. One thing I know is we operated for two years in an emergency. And you know politics for you know, a mayor, a chief executive to have emergency authority for that long is, is remarkable. Um, but to be able to procure billions of dollars worth of services work with our CBE community, our small and local business community right here in D.C., hit all of our goals, get more money from the federal government than anybody in the region faster uh, in reimbursements. Uh, what it meant to me is that our government was running at an optimal level. Um, and it also meant that we were able uh, to crush the curve and save people's lives. You know, I want to say this to you as I say goodbye and I say it with all due respect. You know, I travel the world, and people know Muriel Bowser. And when, I, when they speak of you, it makes me so proud to be a citizen and a resident of the city, having you as our mayor. Thank you, you make us proud, and I stand tall when I'm away from the city. And thank, thank you. you for your leadership, and thank you for joining us tonight. It's been my pleasure. Yes. Thank you. And we'll be back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the broadcast. We're so happy to have the Secretary of the Commonwealth, Virginia, Kate Cole James. Thank you Hello. for joining us. Um, ben Crump needs no introduction. 
um, Dr. Brian Donahue, uh, MD cardiologist in Pittsburgh, and the pastor of Christian Culture Center, Pastor A.R. Bernard. Pastor, so when we talk about faith and leadership, we want to start with you. Wow, you call me pastor and you put it together with leadership and faith. In the Old Testament, there was not the pastor as we know it of a local church. Pastor was a shepherd, and a shepherd was the leader of a nation. So when we think about leadership and faith, it's about shepherding people. Um, you had uh, the guest uh, on the platform, the mayor of Washington, D.C., and um, as I listened to her speak, I thought about leadership in the context of building trust in the people that you serve and building that trust towards that leadership. Uh, when we think about the pandemic that we've been through, um, leaders had a heavy burden upon them to teach people how to adapt quickly and adjust quickly to change. And I think that's leadership. It, it, it takes faith. You know, Dr. Donahue, you're one of the leading cardiologists in the world at the University of Pittsburgh. Faith and leadership also goes directly to hospitals where COVID and people are dying and where people feel they can go and get the kind of healing and the kind of um, attention that will strengthen and lengthen their lives, not shorten it. You know, sometimes we talk about faith and leadership and sometimes we learn, leave Ms. James, a very important sector out, the medical community and the role it plays. Because everybody here at some point in this room is going to end up in a hospital, whether they like it or not. And talk about that and that experience. Well, everybody, that is except you, who take no medicine, <laughs> thrive in the midst of, uh, we should all be so lucky. But, you know, it's, it's a, an interesting moment to share the dias with, with uh, women and men who are so deeply, deeply rooted in the scripture. And it's interesting to think that oftentimes we as physicians, uh, by the way, the original root word for physician uh, is priest, we, we actually um, have managed to somehow carve out our faith to, as it were, kind of leave it behind. And yet we all remember that here in the, in the Bible Museum, the great prophet Jeremiah pointed out that it, which is the word of God, is written in our heart. That is that we all know it to begin with. We can either respond to it and, and let it become the seed of our growth or we can rebel against it. And there are practical implications of those choices. So if you take the point of view as I do that all that we need to know is rooted in God's word, there's formulas in the, in the Bible for health. Uh, and, and those are formulas which are of great use to people. And one of the things I've noticed in sitting watching the earlier presentations is that you've put together, Armstrong, you've curated a group of people that for one reason or another, people will trust their counselor, their, 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 uh, their reverend. That's also the case with physicians. So for 30 years, I've been privileged to be people's heart doctors. And... It's a great honor to have, what, uh, to have that relationship with people. The question of the moment is, how do we use that leverage? Do we use that leverage as servants to move people in the direction of their own greater fulfillment? Or is it a little bit more about us, which makes it corrupt? We heard earlier about some of the concerns about schooling our children, about actually undermining that word of God. And I think it's so important for us as physicians in particular and heart doctors in particular to really ask ourselves, how do we use that native knowledge, that built-in whisper from the master to advance people's um, opportunity to feel well and to live long and, like you, to grow old? Yes. You know, uh, um Ben, you know, the Bible tells us, woe unto the doctors and the lawyers. And, you know, when people think about the, the legal and the medical profession, they think doctors and lawyers contribute to much of the, many of the problems that we have in society today. And so when you find yourself conflicted, because you're one of the leading lawyers, um, I mean, so recognizable all over the world, what happens when you're conflicted? Um, and... You have to make a decision between um, your faith and 
the legal system? How do you wrestle with that? Well, it's very simple for me, Armstrong. You know, my personal hero is Thurgood Marsha. And the one time I got to meet Justice Marsha with the other young students at the HBCUs who were at the Supreme Court, he came over after they left the ceremonial uh, presentation on the bench and they would shake the uh, students and young people's hands. He told us, when you go out into the world and you go in courtrooms, he never said to us, go argue what is legal. He said, you go argue what is right. And I never forgot that because in our heart, Armstrong Williams, we all know what the right thing is to do. The only question is, do we have the courage to do it? And my grandmother would always tell me that, baby, I always do the right thing. I always do the right thing. And sometimes in the most challenging moments, I hear my grandmother's voice in my ear, and I say, Grandma, I'm going to do the right thing. And you go out and do it, even if it's unpopular, even if your knees are shaking. You do the right thing so you can look at yourself in the mirror the next morning. Keiko James, you're Secretary of the Commonwealth. You've held many uh, high-ranking positions um, in the Bush administration. You were recently president of the Heritage Foundation and Governor Glenn Youngkin selected you as his secretary to come with, which is a position of integrity, of hiring. You know, many people have lost faith in politicians on both sides. You know, depending on who you are and what your political leanings are, you love that politicians and hate the other side. But to many people, it's the same. They see politics as being corrupt, as um, making themselves rich. Politicians go to Washington and two years, they're richer than rich. How do we restore integrity and honor and faith in elected officials? I'm not so sure about restoring faith in elected officials. I think we should keep our faith in God. And then we should go out and identify politicians who are actually aligning with our values and our principles, get involved in the political process, and work to get them into office. And so, you know, I've always used as my guide, as um, I've been involved in government and politics for almost 40 years now, um, who are the individuals that align with the things that I know God has taught me through my life? So I align the politicians with scripture and pick based on that, not on party, not on um, uh, personality, uh, but alignment philosophically, ideologically, and theologically with the God of the universe. So, Pastor Bernard, um, where is the church? Where is the church? Yeah, where is the church? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I had a wonderful breakfast with Bishop Desmond Tutu um, before he passed, and we had a conversation because I was in South Africa during apartheid, before apartheid, uh, uh, during apartheid, rather, and uh, after decisions were made and changes were made. And I asked him the same question. I, I said, Bishop, how is the church in South Africa? He said, the church is in crisis. I said, why? He said, because during apartheid, the church knew what it was against. After apartheid, the church didn't know what it was for. And I think the church is in that place of crisis, trying to figure out its role in society once again. You talk about leadership and alignment. Faith is defined as a reasoned trust. And leaders have to give reasons to be trusted. Because if you don't have the trust of the people, all right, they're not going to have the courage to follow you. And too often, you know, we've, we've got more fellowship and no followership. And without followership, you're just taking a walk, right? You're not really leading. <laughs> so... Is the church as significant as it once were? Absolutely. Religion brings a moral value consensus to society, which is necessary for justice, for concord. We need civil structure to preserve order, to restrain evil, to prevent chaos. And there's a delicate balance of the two working together. Here in the West, we talk about separation of church and state, 
But in practice, <laughs> we don't really believe that. And it's a Western construct because the Bible is an Eastern book and an Eastern culture. They work together. They were one. Heaven and earth were one. They were not separate entities. We struggle sometimes to understand the role that we play. Uh, as clergy, we have a responsibility to urge our political officials, those in positions of power, to measure their judgments and their decisions according to God's uh, perspective on the nature and ordering of society. So we have to continually voice prophetically that perspective to them to, again, measure and weigh their judgments. This is your voice, your future. I'm Armstrong Williams, and we'll be back. We're at the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., where we're having this conversation tonight. And welcome back to the broadcast. Dr. Donahue, um, there's just been so many different stories about the protocols of COVID, the mask, the booster. And we know physicians know much more than we'll ever know. And all people really want is the truth. If you tell people the truth, they'll go to the mountain with you. And if you're consistent with it, but it seems like we just don't know what the truth is. What is it that has not been told that can give people some kind of comfort and peace uh, in this pandemic that we find ourselves in? Well, I think your point is it, it follows so elegantly from, from um, the, the prior, uh, I thought, ele very beautiful soliloquy about relationships. And we have to honor and venerate them. If we find ourselves, for whatever reason, at the public dais, we have to choose our words carefully. If people have a sense of trust uh, in, in, in our perspective, we have to honor them, not ourselves. And I feel like what's occurred here over the last couple of years is that our public authorities, to some extent, have maybe not been serving just one master, and the one master is the health of the public. It's very, very important, I think, that we uh, limit ourselves to things that we can say with a certain degree of authority, and that we give people clear guidance. The foggier it is, the, the, the more valued is the lighthouse on the coast. So we've lost just a little bit of that amperage, I think, here. If we step back, though, on the other hand, Armstrong, and look at the, the ballast of the productions that I think you've been at the center of, we're just a world better than we were. Uh, 
And if we go back to the darkest days of all this back in January and February and March of 2020, if we knew back then that we, we would be having this breezy conversation just those, those months later, we would have been thrilled. Remember, we all had this deep existential fear about not being able to grow old with our families and our friends. And here we are. Um, we now have a very, very effective uh, uh, vaccine from this mRNA model. Don't take the bait on this. The purpose of the vaccine was that uh, we would not die of COVID, not that we wouldn't get COVID, that we wouldn't succumb to the illness and pass, as we all saw happening. You'll remember those horrible days in Elmhurst, New York, with the body bags and so forth. We now have testing methods. We now have a whole array of therapeutics, both intravenous and oral, that work. And the, the, the message that I take from that is thank goodness for the people who dedicate their lives and their energy and their intellectual pursuits to solving uh, problems, doing it with dispatch, and I think in this case, doing it in a way that benefits every one of us in this room and every viewer we have across the Fruited Plain. You know, um, as James, the world reminds us that the world has always, um, history reminds us that the world has always been a brutal, bloody, divisive, um, place always ruled by the few over the many slavery the insurrection all this kind of that's gone on through our history so should we be surprised today that the world is in the condition that it's in absolutely not and when i'm spending time with young people on college campuses i am acutely aware of the fact that they are so totally ignorant of history <laughs> and and they don't understand that the world that we are living in today is not unlike or dissimilar to times even during my own lifetime. I can remember the Cuban Missile Crisis and the trauma that we all felt were we gonna be bombarded at any moment. People who've lived through world wars. Uh, if you're an African American and you've lived through the institution and uh, you know, your, your ancestors through slavery and what that all meant. If you understand what's going on on the African continent even today, while people are focused on the Ukraine there, there's death and destruction there. And so I remind them that God prepared us for this. He told us that we were living in a fallen world. And a part of our job as leaders is to figure out how to help people to cope with, deal with, and live in a fallen world. So I'm not really totally surprised by any of that, except for the fact that I am, I am often surprised by how unprepared young people are to live in a fallen world. And a part of that is our responsibility because we have not equipped them to do that. We, are, we should be raising strong children who can live in that world. You know, I, I, I talk to some of my college student friends and they talk about safe spaces and creating these safe spaces. And I said, sweetie, the only safe space is in your mother's arms. And quite frankly, some kids have not even had the benefit of that. So our job is to, to give you the tools that you need to be strong and survive in this chaotic, fallen world. So we don't get to escape the chaos, but God has uniquely prepared us and given us a guidebook for living in it. And many of us have read the end of the book. So we know how it comes out, and we know what happens. But we are, we are not doing young people justice by not giving them the tools, giving them the gospel message, helping them to understand how to be strong men and women of faith and live in a chaotic world. We're just not preparing them. You know, Attorney Crump, I find what you do fascinating. You know my deep respect and honor for you, just a good human being. But you know, when people see you and the cases that you undertake 
and what happens to these young kids. Many young kids, especially young black people, man, believe that is their life. That is their trajectory. That is going to be their outcome. Nothing has changed about America. When I see Ben Crump, I see myself, and he's our champion. But is that, all, is that all of the story? Is there much more to the story that would give them hope that maybe that's not their narrative? Maybe there is a chance for them in America, and it's not always about black and white. Well, certainly. I, um, one of the most encouraging things to me, Armstrong, in the aftermath of the tragic killing of George Floyd was the fact that you saw so many people coming together, uh, standing up saying, we're better than this. You know, and the fact that we had so many of our white brothers and sisters standing in the crowds with our black brothers and sisters and Hispanic brothers and sisters told me that they did not see George Floyd as only a black man, but they saw him as a human being. And they saw that he was worthy and deserving of humanity. And the fact that we saw George Floyd get a measure of justice that had been denied uh, historically for black people, prayerfully and hopefully, set a new precedent where we could believe not just in the rhetoric, but in the reality of equal justice under the law. Because one thing I always do, Armstrong, and you know, you and I have a lot of those early morning conversations after these tragedies, is I always say, when we're picking a jury, I know that everybody in America can recite the Declaration of Independence. But what I want to know if they really believe it when they say we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equally, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that amongst them is life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We want them to believe that. And when they believe that, then not only black children, but white children and brown children will have a better perspective on the future. So, so, Pastor Bernard, with the rise in homicide, you're in New York City where we saw what happened on that train platform. Uh, it's just anything short of a miracle that no one died. Uh, we hear the statistics all around this country, uh, and then people want to go arm themselves. They want to protect themselves because they don't believe law enforcement can get there quick enough. What do we do in these times of chaos? And obviously, many people don't feel it's going to get and it better, you know, faith without my gun doesn't always work. Sometimes I need to have something else. And you know, I'm human, and I keep mine. I'm concealed and carry, I don't make no apologies for it. I gotta have it. And as much as, and I'm human, as much as I believe in God, when I see that bad boy, I say, okay, I have a different, cho I have a different choice here. But how do we reconcile that when we call ourselves, we have all this faith, but yet sometimes we feel we need to protect ourselves? You know, Armstrong, the Bible begins with the book of Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 2. It's beautiful. It's paradise. And by chapter 6, it's a disaster. <laughs> so we humans can mess things up within six chapters. Um, <laughs> the earth was filled with violence. The imagination of men's hearts were evil continually. And just, you know, thinking and reflecting uh, on what K. James had to say about this fallen human condition. That's the reality. And we try to navigate it. As I listen to m my colleagues here, um, it makes me reflect on where we are. We're experiencing... Hold, hold that, hold that, hold that. I don't want to... I'm up about 20 seconds. I don't want to mess that up. I don't want to interrupt it. We'll be back. <laughs>
Pastor, continue. I'm strong as I listen to my colleagues here. You have on this platform collective wisdom and perspective that the elders bring to the table that too often our young people don't appreciate. There was a scientific study done uh, recently that through billboards, television, uh, every platform of technological medium, we process 74 gigabytes of information on a daily basis. That's like watching 16 movies per day. That's how much information we process. So we're in a world that is information rich, but wisdom poor. And when wisdom comes into play because it springs from a set of moral values and principles that are meant to guide us through this dual life that we experience of both good and evil, to navigate it well, when we miss out on that wisdom, we end up in a place where we're, we're, we're very smart and knowledgeable, but we don't know how to apply that knowledge in a way that it's going to better the society and protect us from our fallen selves. So are you saying that we're witnessing the transformation of morality and ethics? I, yeah, because, again, what is wisdom? It, wisdom is the ability to take data, which becomes knowledge, and bring that knowledge and understanding together to make right judgments. You can be so inundated with information that it becomes chaotic, it becomes confusing, because you don't know which piece of information is the truth that you should embrace. That's where we are. So we end up with people having their own truth, and there's no such thing. Everything can't be true. Uh, If that's true, then there's no such thing as a lie, and we know better than that. So... You know, we're in a place where we need the wisdom and perspective of the elders so that they can teach us how to make better moral judgments. But we live in America today, Ms. James, where there's a free fall. It seems that people are not embracing ethics, honesty, morality, truth. We're in the museum of the Bible. That's where we sit right now. In the scripture that was given to us resides truth and wisdom and knowledge. And a part of the responsibility that we have is to make sure that that we impart that wisdom, that truth. You know, the data that comes to us and floods us every day needs to be sifted through, sorted, judged, And without the power of the Spirit of God that dwells within us, sometimes it's a little complicated sorting that all out. And so I think one of the best things that we can do, taking off my government hat and putting on my Mother James hat, Mm. is one of the best things that we can do is introduce this generation to the person of Christ help them understand the role of faith in their daily lives and empower them with the strength they need to navigate this crazy, chaotic world. Because this world isn't going to change. It's going to get worse, in my estimation. And so we've got to equip people for that. So the church has got to be the church and show up and not be afraid of teaching and preaching the gospel of Christ. This is a world that's hurting and desperately needs that, and I don't know how anybody navigates through it or makes it without it. You know, Dr. It's okay. (laughs) Dr. Dr. Donahue, what she's saying is that literally we are losing our moral conscience. And when we lose our moral conscience, what happens? Well, you know, all we have to do is look out the window and see what happens. Every one of us understands the problem. The question then becomes, what is the solution? You know, um, when asked what the fundamental life skill uh, was, an old uh, wise man from India said, discernment. So discerning is to separate the wheat uh, from the chaff. My own sense is that we have this... 
uh, experience that we have the greatest story to tell, the truth of the risen Lord. Here we are in the Bible Museum in the afterglow of Easter. We have the truth. On the other hand, we might need to uh, find new ways to more courageously um, bring that truth to bear. I feel like what we have lacked, frankly, is courage. We don't lack education. We don't lack health. We don't lack um, the, the things that have plagued prior generations. But we haven't, you know, all of us can remember uh, our grandfather. And my bet is that there wasn't uh, a grandfather in the room who any of us would describe as timid. Um, and so prior generations had a kind of boldness of thought in a, uh, that we, uh, to some extent, now lack. And I think one of the reasons for us to get together in these forums that Armstrong has put together is really to remind ourselves that this is a truth that we have to somehow get out of the bottle and let it animate people in their lives. It's something I see after 30 years of taking care of people with uh, oftentimes end-stage heart disease, one way to begin the conversation is to remind people of the victory of their own lives, which oftentimes isn't evident to them as they're ill or they're nearing death, uh, that, that we live a victorious life in the risen Lord. All of us do if we confess that reality. And so it's time for us to not be mealy mouth and not to, uh, as someone once said, color with pastels, but color boldly. Uh, we should not be ashamed of our maker. And likewise, we shouldn't be ashamed of ourselves. So maybe what happens after our collective experience over these presentations is that we leave with a kind of boldness that maybe we uh, came in lacking. You know... What he's saying is that we need these guiding lights in a time of darkness. Which brings me to this, Attorney Crump. I guess you can share with us why it's so important that the United States continue to play a role, not at, just at home but abroad, why the United States must be that light in these days of darkness. Well, I think the American idea is still one of the most preeminent ideas in this world to be able to inspire people. It's why most people want to get to America because they believe in these principles of fairness and liberty and justice. And we have to never ever forget our better angels. Sometimes, as Pastor Bernard and Dr. Donahue and Secretary James was articulating, you know, these are troubled times, but in times of darkness, we must focus ever more vigilantly on the light at the end of the tunnel. And if we focus on that light, we can lead ourselves out of the darkness. I know as I heard Pastor Bernard uh, talk, the one thing I thought about was my fraternity Omega Psi Phi taught us to be a constructive citizen in society or a constructive part of society, we had to accept three things. Uh, and one was fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, and so aristocracy of intellect that was we're forever on a quest to enlighten ourselves so we can be better. We can be a better people. We can be a better community. We can be a better world, and I believe we can be a better world if we continue our quest. Pastor, in the two minutes, okay, it's okay if you want to, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Pastor, in the last two minutes, I'd like for you to shine that light even brighter on what people can do where they are instead of looking to the wisdom and the leadership on this stage. Well, change begins where you are. Change is not an event. Change is a process. It is making a decision that begins to change your future. I think about the words of Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's an Old Testament passage in Proverbs that says that there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is death. So the way you choose matters. Truth matters. The way you live your life matters. 
because it's either going to lead you to success, to prosperity, to dignity, to the common good, or it's going to lead you down a path of destruction. Wow. Listen, we all have a role to play. And you know, the hardest work we do, we should do 24 hours a day is working on ourselves. Because when we do that work 24 hours a day, something very miraculous happens. The world around us immediately improves. It gets better. And the light shines brighter, and others can find that light, and they begin to find their way back home. And we must always find our way back home. And where's the way back home? To that old, what our parents taught us, good living, character, being a good neighbor, not worrying about materialism, but when you go to sleep at night, you're conscious of that peace in the midst of that storm. And I thank you for reminding us that we all are that light. Let us shine that light brighter tomorrow than we did today. And the world will shine back at us. Thank you so much for joining us.